Hey guys, it's Will from LearnRator, and this edition of AP Micro Mondays, we're going to be walking you through minimum wage. And so, minimum wage is a commonly tested concept on AP Micro, and I think the reason why is largely because, you know, a lot of you students out there are are working for minimum wage if you have a job. It's the lowest rate that a, a employer can legally pay you. And therefore, there's a lot of implications in place. But what I want you to think about when you think of minimum wage is I want you to think about it like a price floor. Because essentially, what the government is telling employers is this is the lowest price, the lowest wage that I can pay my workers. So now let's think about it in the respect to an actual graph. I'm going to draw my typical axes here. And on the y-axis, I'm going to put our wage. And then on our x-axis, I'm going to put labor, so quantity of labor. And so when we think about these demand and supply curves, we want to think about it with respect to labor. In the context of labor, this would be supply of labor. And this would be demand of labor. So now let's look at where the original equilibrium occurs, which is where supply intersects demand. And so if we look at this, supply intersects demand at this point, so this is going to be W star, and then this is going to be Q zero. And let's say that W star is equal to 10. And then Q, Q zero, let's say that's 65. So that means that at the minimum, at the original equilibrium wage of 10, there would be 65 people that would be willing to work at that, at that rate. So now let's think about the, what happens in the case where the government comes in and they impose a minimum wage. So in order for a minimum wage to be effective, it needs to be a binding price floor. It can't be too low because then you know, we would just have this overall equilibrium go in place. So we have to set it higher than the equilibrium wage. That could be it right there. So this is going to be our minimum wage. And so now what we can do is we can look at where our minimum wage intersects our overall demand for labor as well as our supply for labor. So let's look at that. Let's see where that intersection occurs. So the intersection of the demand for labor with minimum wage occurs at this point. And then the intersection of supply of labor with the overall, of, with the overall minimum wage occurs at this point. And so this is what our quantity demanded is. And then this is what our quantity supplied is. So as you can tell, this minimum wage is an effective price floor because there are more people that are willing to work at this minimum wage than there are in terms of the amount of work that employers need. So the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded in this scenario. And that makes sense because it's a functional minimum wage. It's doing its part. And so what we might say is that the quantity demanded is 30, for example. And we might say that the quantity supplied is 100. So at this minimum wage, which we might say is set at, you know, let's say that now instead of 10, it's, it's 20. So let's say you know, we're really going out there and we're helping out those people that are working for minimum wage and setting it at 20. What this is saying is that at a minimum wage of 20, 100 people are willing to work at that rate. However, employers are only demanding 30. So let's think about the implications of this, and let's think about you know, what happens in this scenario for the overall quantity demanded. Well, the overall quantity demanded now is going to be you know, 30. However, the quantity supplied is going to be 100. So what we want to think about is a few different questions. So the first question that might be asked on a test would be, you know, what is the unemployment rate? So the unemployment rate is essentially the difference between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. And as we know in the situation of the minimum wage, there's an excess supply. So that would be 100 minus 30, which is equal to 70. And so that would be our unemployment in terms of how many people are unemployed as a result of this. It's this gap right here. This is your unemployment. So the next question that we might be asked is, how many workers lost their job as a result of this minimum wage? Well, what we look at is essentially the difference between the original equilibrium quantity and now the quantity that's demanded. So in this case, we'd be looking at 65 minus 30, which is 35. So that would be the number of people that have lost their job as a result of minimum wage. So now let's think about it from the perspective of how many people now enter the market because of this minimum wage. Well, that would be the quantity supplied minus the original equilibrium quantity. So that would be 100 minus 65, which also happens to be none other than 35. And so 
if we really break this graph down and we look it into its component parts, this portion right here represents the number of people that have now lost their job as a result of the minimum wage being implemented. However, this portion right here represents the amount of people that are now entering the workforce because the wage is now higher. And so these are the main implications that fall into place when you look at minimum wage. The first thing that you want to just look at is you want to make sure that the minimum wage is binding. And the second thing you want to look at is where the minimum wage intersects your demand for labor as well as your supply for labor. And then from there you can calculate the unemployment rate, the amount of jobs that have been lost as a result of this minimum wage, and then finally the amount of workers that are now willing to work because of this higher minimum wage. So that pretty much covers it for this week, but next week we're going to be covering another AP micro topic on accounting versus economic profit.